All right, friends, welcome to you all around the world. Welcome to Follow the Money Radio. So grateful to have you here along for the ride. I'm your host, Jerry Robinson. And today we're diving deep into the heart of the financial revolution where the world of traditional finance and the world of cutting edge crypto assets are colliding. It's a brave new world we've we've entered, one where innovation is king and the rules of the game are being rewritten. We've got a great show lined up for you today, one that's at the very frontier of this financial renaissance we're talking about, which is all about the rise of spot Bitcoin ETFs, a game changer that's making waves in both Wall Street and in the crypto space. And these, by the way, are just not financial instruments. They're the keys to a a realm of possibilities for investors and pretty much a confirmation of the growing acceptance of digital assets. But before we delve into the nitty gritty of these new ETFs, let's set the stage. We're in the middle of a crypto revolution, and it's not just about Bitcoin nearing a new all time high. It's not about the buzz around decentralized finance. It's a bigger transformation, a seismic shift in the way that we think about money how we think about value exchange and the very foundations of the financial system. So today we're going to unravel the layers of this financial evolution. We're going to explore the inception of the spot Bitcoin ETFs. All of them were approved last week. Of course, we're going to be talking about that and their impact upon investor accessibility. We're going to look at some of the market dynamics. We're going to analyze trading trends. We're going to look into the power dynamics that are really driving this current situation. And of course, I'll be sharing my thoughts uh, as well. As an economist, an investor, an author, I've witnessed the ebb and flow of markets. And we've got a front row seat here to this revolution, being in the Bitcoin space now for over a decade. So I'll provide you with my take on these spot Bitcoin ETFs, why I think they're a net positive for investors, and the potential even for a spot Ethereum ETF, perhaps in the next four months or so. And then, of course, also talk about the delicate balance of self-custody, where you actually hold crypto in your own wallet, in your own cold storage, versus the allure of ETFs. So buckle up, my friends. We've got a great show lined up for you today. My name is Jerry Robinson. You're listening to Follow the Money Radio. Let's get started. friends. So in this very first segment, we're going to dive into a topic that's been making waves in the financial world, and that is the ongoing crypto revolution. It's more than just a change. It's a fundamental shift, and it's happening right before our very eyes. And let's set the stage here. Financial history, of course, is marked by transformative moments. And here we stand at the precipice of another one. I don't mean to be too dramatic, but in reality, right now, traditional finance is colliding head on with the disruptive forces of crypto assets. And this clash is reshaping our understanding of money and investments and the very nature of wealth. So as we move ahead, we realize that we are moving in uncharted waters and that the old rules are being rewritten and new chapters are being added. And so let's get to the crux of today's discussion. Really what we're focused on today in this episode is spot Bitcoin ETFs. I'm sure most of you know the recent approval by the United States Securities and Exchange Commission, known as the SEC, approved 11 ETFs linked to the spot Bitcoin market last week. And that is a seismic development. This has been, quite frankly, years in the making. It's probably been over a decade now since the very first application for a Bitcoin ETF was put forward by the Winklevoss twins. Uh, This was many years ago, and the SEC has been dragging its feet for a very long time on this and has been fighting at every inch of the way. But that's over now. Now we have the spot Bitcoin ETF. So let's deal with let's deal with where we are. What exactly are spot Bitcoin ETFs? That's a question we've been receiving quite a bit here at Follow the Money is people are saying, I know what Bitcoin is and I know what an ETF is, but what's a spot Bitcoin ETF? And why should you care? Well, let's just break it down real simply. The spot Bitcoin ETF, and maybe we should just focus on spot ETFs in general, they differ from their future based counterparts by being directly linked or tethered to the spot market. Okay, the spot market is where Bitcoin is bought and sold for immediate delivery. There's a spot market for gold, there's a spot market for silver, there's a spot market for uranium, there's a spot market for most commodities, and there's a spot market for Bitcoin. 
Now, in this case, with a spot ETF, you're not dealing with futures contracts. You're, you don't have no intermediaries. You just have the raw, immediate transaction of Bitcoin. And this distinction makes spot Bitcoin ETFs a more direct conduit to the real value of Bitcoin. Think of it as like a direct route to the current market price of an asset. In the realm of cryptocurrencies, a spot ETF, especially when it comes to Bitcoin, really mirrors the immediate spot market. So in simple terms, when you invest in a spot ETF, you're essentially investing in the price of the real tangible Bitcoin as it trades on the spot market. So spot ETFs are like a snapshot of the present moment. The value of the ETF closely tracks the current market value of Bitcoin, and it's a direct one-to-one -one relationship with the underlying asset, which reflects the market sentiment and immediate pricing. So that's very different, of course, from future-based ETFs, which instead of mirroring the current market price, a futures-based ETF, which is what we've had here in the United States, we've had ETFs that track Bitcoin futures. Well, these ETFs derive their value from futures contracts, and a futures contract is essentially an agreement to buy or sell an asset uh, at a predetermined price at a specific time in the future. So futures-based ETFs can introduce a lot of complexity, and the value of the ETF isn't really completely determined by the current market sentiment, but is influenced by expectations and speculations about the future price of Bitcoin. So it, it adds a layer of you know, abstraction and, and maybe even a level of detachment from the immediate market dynamics. And that's why spot Bitcoin ETFs, I believe, are going to be superior to the, you know, futures based ETFs we've had approved up until now. Now, you may be listening to this and you say, well, you know, how does this matter to me? Well, the answer is basically in the accessibility. Right. So cryptocurrencies, especially Bitcoin, have long been seen as the outsiders of the financial world. And over the years, you know, it's become easier to get access to Bitcoin. But, you know, over a decade ago, you know, it was pretty difficult uh, to figure out how to buy it. If you even knew about Bitcoin, then you would have to figure out how to buy it. And it became a, you know, a pretty complex thing for, for many years. Slowly but surely, the on-ramps to the cryptocurrency space have been improving, and it's been allowing a lot of retail investors to come in. But institutional investors, and what I mean by that is, you know, the big you know, banks on Wall Street and a lot of the hedge funds and mutual funds and uh, uh, ETFs and whatnot, and even corporations, for that matter, who want to put Bitcoin on their balance sheet, you know, they really haven't had um, a way to get in outside of the futures market, which we already talked about which was you know, a recent development just a few years ago. So when we look at Bitcoin itself, now we have this spot Bitcoin ETF. Now we have the dynamics that are shifting. We're witnessing the construction of a bridge between the old world of finance and this new world that we are seeing built in the crypto space. And this newfound accessibility means that investors, who many of which have kind of lingered on the sidelines, due to the perceived complexity of the crypto market, now have a regulated and familiar entry point. In essence, you know, these new, all of these new investors who are buying spot Bitcoin ETFs, whether they be retail, you know, investors or institutional investors, they can all now dip their toes into the Bitcoin waters without navigating the intricacies of private wallets and crypto exchanges and security concerns and private keys. Now, to me, they're giving up something extremely important. And I want to kind of share my thoughts on that because the introduction of spot Bitcoin ETFs, as I've mentioned, is undoubtedly a net positive for investors as a whole. You know, it's like opening the doors and inviting more people to be able to, you know, invest in Bitcoin. And when you have 21 million Bitcoin in existence total, that'll ever be mined. And then you, then you realize that, you know, a good three to four million of those are already lost. Uh, due to, you know, just poor transactions or transactions that went awry, um, then you realize you're dealing with a very limited, finite asset uh, with a very controlled inflation rate. And so when you open the door and allow all of these investors to be able to come in and not have to worry about the, you know, the security necessarily of Bitcoin, then you're going to create a lot more demand against a supply that cannot go up. You know, it's literally, it's, it's predetermined. The inflation rate, of course, it's going up slightly, but that inflation rate gets cut and cut and cut all the way out to 2140. So traditional investors and institutional investors now suddenly have the ability to get involved with Bitcoin and, 
you know, maybe they've been watching from the sidelines and now they have a more familiar, familiar vehicle that they can use to participate uh, in, in Bitcoin. Now, while we are celebrating the, you know, the, the advent of these spot Bitcoin ETFs, we cannot forget the essence of cryptocurrencies, and that is decentralization and self-custody. So there's a certain beauty to, you know, holding your own private keys and being in complete control of your digital assets. And to me, this is how all of our you know, members and students should approach it. This is what we teach here at Follow the Money for the last decade. It's the importance of you know, buying only what you want to risk, you know, money, using money only you can risk to buy into uh, you know, high-quality cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, and then to keep those in your possession, self-custody, and not give them to third parties. Right? That kind of defeats the whole purpose of what Bitcoin is. So these ETFs, of course, provide that convenient on-ramp, but they're not a substitute for the empowerment that comes from having true ownership and self-custody of your Bitcoin. And I should add also that I do believe that these spot Bitcoin ETFs are going to drive the price of Bitcoin much higher over time. Uh, we are just beginning to see the impact of this new uh, creation of the spot Bitcoin ETF. But we also now, now that this is a reality, attention is now turning to Ethereum as the next potential focus for the industry. In fact, if you notice what happened in the price, we'll talk a bit more about the market dynamics and the trends that happened in, uh, in our next segment. We're gonna do that in just a minute. But uh, when you look at what happened to uh, Ethereum in the wake of the release of the spot Bitcoin ETF, you saw Ethereum just surge and people said, why is Ethereum going up? And Bitcoin went up and then came back down. Ethereum went up and stayed up. So people said, why is Ethereum going up? Well, Ethereum, is uh, very likely the next uh, spot ETF that's going to be approved by the SEC. In fact, BlackRock has already, you know, applied for a spot Ethereum ETF. And so the eyes of investors began to turn to the next crypto that was going to see this happen. Very likely going to be Ethereum. We suspect that it'll happen, uh, you know, by the summertime. So by the summer, we expect a spot Ethereum ETF will be approved. And that Obviously, we're beginning to see the market show optimism regarding that approval. So, all right. So in our next segment, uh, we're going to delve into the market dynamics and the trends, uh, the trading volume, the impact upon the price of Bitcoin and what it means for the larger financial ecosystem now that these spot Bitcoin ETFs have been approved. Stick around. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Follow the Money Weekly. And here's Jerry Robinson. All right, friends, welcome back to Follow the Money Radio. I'm your host, Jerry Robinson, sitting here in the captain's chair, and we have uh, a lot more to cover. So let's just move right back in to what we've been talking about, spot Bitcoin ETFs, this advent of a crypto revolution that began over a decade ago and is really gaining steam now. What I want to do in this segment is I want to talk about the uh, market response. Let's talk about the initial market response. So with the introduction of spot Bitcoin ETFs, uh, what we saw was a whopping $4.6 billion in trading volume on the first day alone. That was historic. That was a massive record. And investors, both institutional and retail, wasted no time jumping in on this opportunity. But as seasoned investors know, the initial response is just the first chapter of a much larger story. So we fast forward to the third day of trading. And we saw some pretty interesting things. The, the top three spot Bitcoin ETFs led by Grayscale, BlackRock, and Fidelity really emerged as uh, the champions, gobbling up nearly 90% of the trading volume. 
Um, now, these volumes, while slightly tapering off from the initial frenzy, maintained a very healthy pace, and trading activity for these new funds surpassed $9.5 billion cumulatively over the first three days. And that's a pace that you know puts it in, in a place of the most successful ETF launches in history. Now, one word on Grayscale. Grayscale has been around for a while, uh, and it's been a trust. GBTC is the ticker. And a lot of the volume there was not actually people buying it, but actually selling it, uh, selling it and moving over to other uh, uh, other ETFs. And the primary reason is because of the stout fee that uh, Grayscale has placed upon its Bitcoin ETF, a 1.5% fee. That's, you know, that's an outrageous uh, fee when you think about it long term, whereas its competitors like Fidelity and uh, BlackRock are charging s- substantially lower fees. And that's, of course, going to draw people uh, in. So now what all this is setting up is really a race for dominance. So as we navigate through these early days, it's really becoming a race for dominance. BlackRock, which many you know assume is going to be the liquidity king here, is really aiming to dethrone grayscale. And we don't think it's going to take long for that to happen. Um, But it's not just about numbers and trading volumes. It's a silent but pivotal battle for influence over the narrative. You see, whoever controls this space is really going to control the narrative. And that's going to be steering the ship for Bitcoin. And that brings in some uncomfortable things, I think, for those who are committed to the decentralization aspect, of course, of Bitcoin. And If we see BlackRock, for example, take the lead, we may witness a recalibration of how institutional investors perceive and approach uh, cryptocurrencies. In one respect, it could be good. And on other respects, it could be negative. In one sense, BlackRock, with its vast financial influence, could really steer demand toward Bitcoin mined with green energy or, you know, other types of energy that are cleaner, we could see that. Uh, And that's not a bad thing. That's actually a good thing. But we could also see something negative where, you know, BlackRock really begins to demonize self-custody, which is something entirely that it would very likely do. That is, those who hold their cryptocurrency in their own wallet, you know, that could be demonized. That could be uh, viewed in a derogatory way because it's good for business for people not to do that, but to give their money to BlackRock and buy Bitcoin through them. Uh, and so, you know, there's a lot of different things that could come out of this. We could see BlackRock pushing for sustainable mining practices. Again, that's not a bad deal. That's a great thing. But again, who's going to control that narrative, right? And that's really what's happening. We've had also the Bitcoin maxis. These are the people who believe that Bitcoin is the only cryptocurrency, you know, that anybody should buy or anybody should own and that all others are cheap imitators. Um, you know, we've seen them champion decentralization and censorship resistance, and they may find that their influence is eroded, obviously, through these Wall Street giants as they begin to assert themselves. So we're setting up here for a struggle between, you know, the old guard Bitcoin maxis and then this the new entrance here being Wall Street as they're going to be exerting their influence in the space. Um, but here's the deal. Bitcoin its success lies in decentralization and the checks and balances that have been woven into its code that make it resistant to sudden and sweeping changes. So, you know, it's really interesting to see what's going to happen, but this story is still being written and we have front row seats, as I had mentioned. I mean, undoubtedly, we're watching all of this very attentively. Now, uh, amid all of this excitement, we got to tread with caution, right? Not everyone in the traditional financial realm is raising the crypto banner. In fact, some voices like Vanguard remain very cautious to the point of emphasizing that they will not have any new spot Bitcoin ETFs issued and they're not going to have them on their platform. In fact, it was reported that Vanguard has actually halted buying of GBTC Grayscale, whereas before they were, you know, people were able to buy it. So Vanguard is really drawing a line in the sand in the wake of this and they are sticking to what they know stocks, bonds, you know, paper assets. So there's a lot of skepticism. We also saw the head of the investment strategy group of Goldman Sachs uh, say that cryptocurrencies have no place in an investment portfolio. And there are many people in the traditional financial realm who are saying similar things. Uh, These naysayers have been around from the beginning. I don't suspect they're going to change their minds anytime soon. But nonetheless, investors, of course, now have a way to get exposure to Bitcoin through an ETF. And I think this is, quite frankly, going to really evolve in an interesting way. If I had to predict what's going to happen, uh, I would suspect 
that we're going to see lots of money flow into these ETFs and that it may become a very common way to hold Bitcoin. We saw something very similar when iShares launched its very first spot gold ETF. For those who remember that, it was back in 2004. And that revolutionized uh, gold. Remember gold, you know, people didn't know how to buy gold, you know, back in 2004. BlackRock knew this. They took advantage of this, of course. But, you know, the average person said, where would you go buy a, a bar of gold? You go to the pawn shop. You know, people didn't really know how to do it. Uh, and you could always call an 800 number on TV, but you end up paying, you know, exorbitant fees, usually because they would bait and switch you with, you know, some sort of a, you know, a raw deal. And so just trying to get access to, you know, low cost, low fees kinds of uh, physical gold, you know, was difficult. And so iShares, created their gold ETF, that's BlackRock, back in 2004. And it revolutionized, quite frankly, the access to the investment access to gold. And so people were like, wow, I can buy gold, I get exposure to the price, but I don't have to hold it. I don't have to store it. And instead, I just pay the small fee to iShares to have access to physical gold. Well, iShares kicked down the door for many other issuers who also began to you know, create gold ETFs. And so you had a, a new way to hold gold. Now, I, I view gold ETFs the same way I view these spot Bitcoin ETFs, the same thing. Uh, if I want to own gold, uh, why would I want to own it? Well, I own gold for insurance. And so therefore, I want to own it in my hand. I want to hold it in my hand. Uh, I don't want some third party holding it for me. That defeats the whole purpose. Now, sometimes you don't have a choice. Sometimes if it's in a, you know, a tax deferred account or something and you have to hold it you know, outside of your possession, well, that makes sense, of course. But anytime you can hold it in your hand, well, that's what you prefer to do, you know, uh, especially when it's something like gold or Bitcoin, which the whole purpose of it is to provide you protection from the centralized uh, financial players, right? So, so anyway, so we saw with gold, with the spot gold ETF, that it really drove a lot of demand and fresh demand. And now a lot of people have exposure to gold, not through physical gold, but through ETFs. And I think it's going to be similar with Bitcoin, that you're going to have a lot of people now begin to move into their 401k, their IRA, a position in Bitcoin, uh, maybe a 1%, 2% position. But all of this means good things for those invested in Bitcoin, in my opinion, and who are holding it responsibly, ideally, in their own wallet, cold storage, self-custody. But overall, we see Bitcoin going up. And our price target, by the way, on Bitcoin remains the same. In fact, I want to share my price target with you on the other side of this break. I want to talk about where I think Bitcoin's going to go, and we'll wrap up today's episode. Uh, stick around. We'll be right back. <laughs> All right, friends, welcome back to the closing moments of today's broadcast. Uh, and as I mentioned, I want to tell you our price target for Bitcoin for 2025. We have a 2025 price target. We've had this now for some time. And we believe that Bitcoin is going to reach a price of $275,000 by the end of 2025. It could come earlier, but by the end of 2025, we believe the price will have hit $275,000. Now, that's quite a leap from where we are now. As we do this broadcast this morning, we are seeing a price of Bitcoin at around just above $42,000. So, you know, Bitcoin is trading right around $42,000. We believe that it could be as high as $275,000 by the sometime in 2025, likely by the end of 2025. And that's due to many factors. Of course, the new spot e ETF, which is going to give a lot of exposure, create more demand, more on ramps for people to get involved. But then also the halvening, which is coming up, which has really been overshadowed by these spot Bitcoin ETFs, that the halvening is coming up in April. So we're just, you know, a few months away from that. That's also going to slash the inflation rate on Bitcoin. And instead of 900 new Bitcoin being available every day, at a natural inflation rate, it's going to get cut to 450, right? So that's really going to be a, a change. And just as the uh, amount of Bitcoin available uh, every day is going down, uh, you're going to have demand suddenly sloping up. And we don't have anything like Bitcoin uh, in our history that we can look at and say, we have a finite asset that is programmed to have uh, inflation rate that goes down and down and down, and they can't find any more. So it's a very different kind of asset. That's why we believe the price is going to go higher. If we go out to 2030, we have a much higher 
price target. We won't talk about that today, but for now, 2025 price target, $275,000. We believe that that's realistic. We believe that that could very well happen. And, you know, if we want to break it down into a range, we would say somewhere between 225 and 300,000 with 275 kind of being the number that we've settled on. So anyway, that's that kind of provides you with a nice overview of what's been happening. You know, we let's summarize a few of the key points we've uncovered in this in this episode. First, we have witnessed the birth of a new era with the approval of spot Bitcoin ETFs. The SEC finally approved them after getting shot down by Grayscale in a lawsuit. And they knew that if they didn't approve these 11 ETFs, they were going to get sued 11 times. So 11 more times. And so they said, you know what, let's just go ahead and approve these. And they did it very begrudgingly. We should note that if you especially if you read the note uh, from uh, uh, Gary Gensler, the head of the SEC. So Grayscale, BlackRock, Fidelity, these names uh, really are kind of the winners here uh, in this space. But Grayscale with a big asterisk, because even though it had a lot of volume, much of it was selling volume and it's expense ratio is very high. I personally like a few of these different ETFs. I like the Fidelity ETF that is being offered. I like the BlackRock ETF. Uh, there's a few others. I don't really care for the Grayscale, never have. Uh, and I really don't like it even now with the one and a half percent expense ratio. I think it's outrageous. So, you know, to me, BlackRock or Fidelity, uh, even the Vanek uh, ETF looks also good. There's several of them. And we'll be talking more about those with our members on our uh, weekly webcasts. But the market response that we saw, the, the trends that we saw, the huge volume that we saw, and the institutional giants that were involved in all of this help us see that the world is slowly but surely waking up to the reality of this new asset class. And the euphoria that surrounded the release of these ETFs uh, is probably going to fade, of course. Uh, so we want to be careful not to get real caught up in this moment. Um, and we also need to realize that spot Bitcoin ETFs are not just financial instruments. They really are uh, catalysts for change. Now, the Bitcoin maxis may stand their ground, but the entry of institutional heavyweights has really kind of complicated the picture and muddied the water. So the race for dominance here is on and the power dynamics and the struggle we're going to see between these big financial giants is going to be very, very interesting to watch. Before we conclude today's uh, very special podcast episode, I want to share with you just two really important rules that we share with our members here and students about cryptocurrencies. We've been investing in this space for over a decade, and as many of you know, and it's a space that we think deserves lots of caution, deserves a lot of uh, prudence. You don't just jump into the space. It's a very, it's rife with all kinds of problems if you're not being careful and cautious. So the first thing I would tell you is that if you are investing in Bitcoin or spot Bitcoin ETFs or whatever the case might be, never invest more than you can afford to lose, right? Because you certainly could. And for us, the way we approach that is we invest up to 5% of our total investable assets into digital assets, right? So 5%, that's not a very big number, but whenever you do it regularly and over time through a DCA strategy, the way we do it, dollar cost averaging, you know, it really pays off. We've been very happy with that. Now you may have a different number that works for you, but for us, 5% of our assets move towards cryptocurrencies. And it's been that way for a long time. The second rule would be to, if you can, if at all possible, keep your crypto off of the exchanges and to keep them in cold storage. That means to hold them in a hardware wallet offline, right? So they're not in a hot wallet online somewhere where somebody can hack them. Now, you don't have that choice with spot Bitcoin ETFs. Uh, the custodian for the coins uh, that are held by these ETFs is actually Coinbase for the majority of them. Fidelity is actually holding their own in cold storage. But so in that case, Fidelity might be a better uh, ETF to consider if you're more concerned about the cold storage and um, not, you know, not re involving a third party. But nonetheless, Fidelity is itself a third party. So you're, you're not going to be able to remove that risk. If you invest in ETFs, you're just simply going to have to trust. Uh, there will be some backing for you, of course, through the SIPC and some of these different institutions. But nonetheless, realize that when you do buy crypto, 
you don't want to leave it on some sort of cryptocurrency exchange. You always want to try to hold it in cold storage, if at all possible. I realize it's not always possible. So with those two rules uh, laid down, I sure hope that provides you with a lot of value today. And now as we draw the curtains on today's episode, I want to leave you with a final word. And it's a quote that encapsulates the essence of what we've been exploring. And it comes from the pen of the ancient Chinese philosopher and writer, Sun Tzu, when he wrote, in the midst of chaos, there is also opportunity. You know, this ancient wisdom holds true for the crypto markets as well. And the chaos of evolving technologies, regulatory nods and approvals and disapprovals and market dynamics and trading trends lies the opportunity for those who dare to understand and navigate the turbulence. It's a brave new world ahead. And your reaction to this moment will determine your personal outcome. And that's just something to think about. Remember, friends, when you want the truth about the global economy, just follow the money. Thanks again for joining me on today's fascinating journey. And as always, stay informed, stay empowered. And until next time, my friends, God bless. podcast is strictly for informational and educational purposes. It should not be construed as specific investment advice. The views and opinions of our guests and sponsors, including Tom Cloud, are their own and do not necessarily represent the views of FTMDaily.com or Robinson Media Group, LLC. Jerry Robinson does hold an insurance license and at times may offer consulting on life insurance and fixed retirement income products. Follow-up, individualized responses to email or phone requests that involve the rendering of personalized investment advice for compensation will not be made absent compliance with state investment advisor registration requirements or an applicable exemption or exclusion and applicable insurance regulations. Past performance is not indicative of future results. You should be aware of the real risk of loss in following any strategy or investment decision discussed on the podcast. Remember, never do your financial planning through podcast or radio. It's your money. Be wise. Do your due diligence and always consult a trusted financial professional before making any financial decisions.